Hi, Neil Lazarus here, and welcome to another podcast the day after the general elections in Israel. And now it's clear to say that Benjamin Netanyahu has won another four years of power in Israel, making him the longest serving prime minister to date. For those of you who were watching, and m- much of uh, the pe- people of Israel, including myself, were up most of the night watching the results coming in. My wife said, I do need a hobby. Um, it was a fascinating night. 10 o'clock saw the exit polls uh, come out on all three major Israeli channels. Um, some of you may have seen it live. I was broadcasting that live on Twitter. If you don't follow my Twitter account, by the way, uh, it's at Awesome Seminars. Very much recommend you do. Um, and there, uh, depending on what station you saw, there were slightly uh, mixed results. But what became apparent very quickly, and I had predicted it on the podcast, was that Benny Kantz was unable to make a majority uh, of 61. Now, I remind you, in the Knesset in Israel, there's 120 seats. You need to get 61. So these are the results. Um, and I put a little... Um, what's the word, disclaimer um, next to them, Uh, for one simple reason, which is I'm reading them to you at the time that there's 97.3% of all the votes are counted. Um, And you'll see why that's important regarding Naftali Bennett. But this is not the final final, but near enough final uh, results, which saw the uh, Netanyahu's camp, in other words, all of the right-wing parties, what they call the right-wing gush, uh, having 65 seats, where the uh, centre-left with Benny Gantz would have 55. And when we talk about blocks, that's all of the parties coming together, whether they're on the left and the right. Remember, it's not just um, the largest party, but who can get a majority of 61 seats in the Knesset? Reminder, reminder, there's 120 seats in the Knesset. You have to get a simple majority of 61 to form the next uh, government. What will happen is that the president of um, the state, uh, Rivlin, will um, ask one of the uh, members of Knesset, assumably, Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to try and form a coalition. He will do so within 30 days. Now, again, he's not going to have a trouble, uh, a problem doing that, uh, where you see, again, um, the near enough final votes are um, Likud 35 uh, and Blue and White Party also uh, 35. It enables Netanyahu to have his fifth government. Now, what's also interesting is um, the following, that it's not only a uh, right-wing Knesset, it's also a Haredi Knesset. Um, Both Shas, the ultra-Orthodox Sephardi party by Ari Deri, remember Ari Deri's been in prison before, Um, uh, got eight seats. They represent uh, Sephardi Mizrahi, um, and generally orthodox, ultra-orthodox, as well as the uh, United Torah Party, which got eight. Um, Khadash and Tal, which the uh, Arab parties and communist parties can, uh, combined, got six seats. And the big story, not surprising, was the crash of Avoda Labour. Six seats. That is appalling absolutely appalling uh, and they ran quite a good campaign um, is this the end of the Labour Party will the Labour Party now have to combine with merits um, we'll have to see um, so that that was important Yisrael Beitenu um, Avidor Lieberman's party remember he resigned uh, his position of Minister of Defence um also, we thought he was maybe on the board line, yes, maybe may, maybe no, not getting back in, got five seats. Um, a hood you mean, which is important, uh, remember, they are the national religious, which also combined with Otsma, uh, which are the Kahanists, uh, got five seats, uh, which says something about um, what 
who will be in the coalition. Merits Israel's uh, traditional left wing, you know, solid left, if you like, was getting four or five seats, and Kulano uh, got four seats. Again, this is not final, final, uh, but I wanted to get this podcast out. There may be a change of a seat or two. One of the uh, seats which we're waiting for is to see whether Naftali Bennett got in. Um, it will either be not in the Knesset or four seats in the Knesset. There's no halfway uh, mark uh, there. So some interesting results uh, so far. One of the surprises and one of the... Um, Calculations. I think the Israeli media got wrong, uh, was the whole story of Moshe Feiglin. First of all, for those of us with a longer collective memory, or as a friend and colleague of mine said, my generation, that's disturbing. Um, we remember Moshe Feiglin as the radical uh, leader of Zuat Seinu, um, who was leading the protests against... Uh, the Oslo Accords and etc. been and sitting in the streets, but that is over 23 years ago now. Um, so we will um, put that aside. But what is interesting is he emerged. And many people in the media was uh, media in Israel were talking about um, that they expected him to get anywhere up to seven or eight seats. Um, interesting guy, libertarian, messianic, believes and supports in the creation of uh, the third temple. Um, somewhat racist towards the Arab population here um, supports the legalization of cannabis thought there was, he was going to get around seven seats he didn't get in it was seriously awkward they were expecting a party didn't get in at all and I tweeted will he be uh, the next um, kingmaker in other words a party that Likud would be dependent on to make its coalition Today, totally irrelevant. For those uh, listening from abroad in particular, I think it's often a major question. What is it about Benjamin Netanyahu that enables him to get re-elected? And I think there's a number of elements here coming together. First of all, love him or hate him. Let's take the emotion aside. I do that with Trump as well, by the way. You know, today you can't talk about politicians without uh, getting overexcited. Um, so I'm going to take the emotion aside and try and understand what is the uh, Netanyahu phenomena. Um, and it really is a phenomena, considering he's been now in, will be in power for his fifth term. There's a couple of things. First of all, I think he's the ultimate politician in many ways. Um, he uh, was educated in the States very American, uh, knows how to play uh, the foreign uh, leadership or, or the fo leadership of foreign countries. Not irrelevant, by the way. Uh, I, I would argue that both uh, Donald Trump and Putin helped Netanyahu on the international stage before the elections. Um, the Golan Heights Declaration certainly helped the releasing of uh, the body of an Israeli soldier who'd been missing since the Lebanon War uh, and help with the Russians there also helped uh, Netanyahu come in. So he's very much respected. Now, I know, not from the left, but if the generation uh, we're living today, rightly or wrongly, in a generation of populism um, and nationalism, uh, those uh, politicians who buy into that ideology very much re um, uh, respect Netanyahu. So number one, I think, is an international leader, whether we like it or not. Second of all is uh, his ability at home. Uh, one of the more disturbing things I find about Netanyahu is his ability to uh, divide. Um, and we've seen that uh, with other politicians, uh, including Trump. Um, he has no hesitation in saying Arabs are going to come out and vote. You should, as Likud supporters, come and vote to uh, counter them. He talks about the left uh, in derogative manners, uh, also uh, problematic. But again, again, that's the history of Netanyahu. Um, he did the same uh, at the time of Yitzhak Rabin, and I would argue hasn't really changed that much uh, since. So 
he knows how to play, play excuse me to the ground uh, to the um, ground base um, he knows how to play to his supporters and today Israel whether we like it or not is a right religious country that's the results guys again whether we like it you don't like it I hate it when the, the left starts sulking get out there and run a campaign like the Likud did uh, I I got to give it to Netanyahu Likud's campaign in this election was brilliant brilliance an English word meaning very good um, I'll give you a couple of examples when that um, both Netanyahu and Gantz went to APAC. Some of you may have heard him speak there. When Netanyahu went, he met with Trump. They were wearing the same ties, the same suits. He got the declaration on the Golan Heights. And more than that, the videos were made and repeated and repeated and repeated on commercials all over social media. If you have a look uh, at what um, Gantz did, he went to APAC. I haven't seen a film of Gantz speaking at APAC, and I follow this stuff, except for a few news clips. They didn't portray him as an international leader on the international stage who could counter Netanyahu. Uh, what he did do was give a spontaneous interview uh, to Israeli journalists where he was tired. Um, he uh, There was a sound problem, uh, and it just looked awful. Not only did it look awful, but the Likud, the Likud, got the videos of this terrible interview, which most people didn't actually see, played it over and over and over and over and over and over again, showing him as weak, showing Gantz as weak. That ability to create the agenda of the campaign, you've got to give it to the Likud uh, campaign, uh, whoever ran it. Um, pure brilliance. And I think that that's the credit uh, that the Likud deserves tapping on again whether you like it or don't like it um where am israel is the people of israel are uh this election was also uh, a trial of netanyahu i remind you everything after this elections are to do with his legal problems if three chief of staffs cannot in one party toppled Netanyahu, who is about to be put on trial for three major uh, offences, including corruption. If the left cannot question the direction of Netanyahu's policy, when there is no peace policy with the Palestinians, it says something about the left in this country. Um, and, you know, uh, it, the, this country Israel today is where the people of Israel are whether we like it or not to the right and to the religious right I notice um, one of the results which we should comment on is that both Shas and the United Torah got 8 seats that's 16 seats out of 120 do the maths but it's more than 10% um that's important as well. Look, that's going to have implications for the right of return. That's going to have a right to, um, uh, of who is a Jew. That's going to have implications for the Western Wall. That's going to have implications on reform jury. That's going to have implications on uh, the Israeli-American relationships or American jury and their relationship with Israel. If that had already been in question um, prior to the elections, both by Netanyahu uh, cuddling up to Trump uh, and the issue of a formed jury not being recognized in Israel so on and so forth I think that's going to become an even bigger issue after these elections but that's where Israel is today again uh, I, I, I don't know maybe I need to do another podcast on this um, but one of the things which I find very frustrating about people um, who talk about Israel to me especially Americans and I just came back from a trip crazy tour time uh, been in America been in uh, Canada been in South Africa and tomorrow I'm going to the UK to uh, speak um, is okay I don't want is this idea of I don't want anything to do with Israel anymore I can't stand that in Yahoo so on and so forth but Israel is an independent country um, it is 
representing where the people want. Uh, and you can say that for any other country. Um, can people make mistakes? Brexit? <laughs> that was a historically bad one. Uh, yet the people voted in a referendum. America voted uh, for Trump. Again, I know with the discrepancies of the electoral system, blah, blah, blah. But that's the game we play. So sometimes if you want democracy, you've got to play by the rules. And the rules representing Israel more than anywhere else, I would argue, where Israel is today. And what we've got a flash view of of Israel is in Israel, 2019, to the right, doesn't see a two-state solution as particularly relevant. Um, religious stroke traditional at its base with the growing influence of the ultra-Orthodox. Issues such as um, respecting the right of return. So, excuse me, uh, respecting the law of... Uh, um, yeah, the basis of law. I, I'm wittering a bit. I've been up all night. You're going to excuse me on this podcast, okay? Um, uh, respecting also uh, the Supreme Court of Israel. All of those issues are less important to Israelis. I remind you, I said it a minute ago, you have three super, um, chief of staffs unable to even put a dent on uh, Netanyahu. And I think that that is the story of these elections. So if these uh, elections were um, an indication of where Israel is today, uh, also an indication that the rule of law, that's what I was looking for, not a right to return, the rule of law uh, is of less interest to most Israelis, uh, that that this election, if you like, was a test for Netanyahu and he won it big time. That liberal Israel is a minority, uh, an Israel that represents uh, the rule of law, the Supreme Court, um, the police, a critical media is seen as a minority and a target by the prime minister to criticise. The other issue we need to bear in mind is two things. One, this is the election before the trials of Netanyahu. And two, these are the elections before Trump's declaration of what to do with the West Bank. On the trials, it's not by um, accident or coincidence, or maybe it is, that we're seeing some of the major parties also having an interest in Netanyahu's trials. Look, Shas, who are pledging allegiance, um, Ari Derry spent time in prison. Um, I think he would be very open to passing legislation, which may mean that a sitting prime minister um, has... Um, or cannot be sued. So that could be another issue. In other words, could legislation be passed which gives um, a sitting prime minister clemency and not being allowed to be um, prosecuted whilst in office? Sounds crazy, right? That's what's being talked about. Um, you also have that with the United Torah. So again, these are elections which may see... Uh, a consensus in the connect in the Knesset to allow legislation to be passed, which would make Netanyahu's legal problems easier. That's worrying. Two, Trump's peace process. Um, again, Netanyahu. One of the interesting things with Netanyahu was he said twenty four hours before the elections that if he was going to be elected, he would annex. Um, areas of the West Bank. Now, we've got the Trump um, agenda coming up. Um, Kushner's talked about it. Nikki Haley, before she resigned, uh, talked about it. Uh, and what we're expecting is that the Trump administration would recognize areas as an independent Palestine, including Gaza and perhaps areas A, but it would also recognize the annexation of areas of the West Bank. Uh, Gush Etzion areas, Ariel areas, maybe areas C, um, Malaya Domim, 
uh, so on and so forth. The map isn't yet been, hasn't yet been published. Um, so that declaration by Netanyahu fits in there. Um, it's a great one for the right in Israel. It is the end of a two-state solution. No one is talking about yet what would happen to the Palestinians in those annexed areas. Would they be given full voting rights? Uh, if not, that is a very serious challenge to the democratic nature of the state of Israel. Um, all of that is yet to come. But again, Netanyahu is very, very astute. Any promise of annexation only bode well for him. He manages to consume many of his opponents on the right. Assumably, um, Naftali Bennett won't get in, or at best would only get four. Appeases American interest with Trump. His declaration would fit into anything that is coming. Pure brilliance. The guy is a genius. And if you hate him, hate him. But he's a genius. Politically, a mastermind of... Uh, how to run a campaign, how to fill the pulse of Israel, uh, and, yeah, divide and rule. What happened in on the left, yes, we saw the collapse of uh, labor, yes, we saw the collapse of merits, but basically it was a reshuffling. So, great, the Blue and White Party did very well, got 35 uh, seats only after two months of existing yawn. The reality is they didn't steal any seats from the right. To win this election, the left and the centre-left had to have taken Netanyahu's supporters and brought them over. And that they failed to do. Worth noting, by the way, uh, another element uh, was the bad turnout by the Israeli Arab votes. Uh, in the last hours of the elections, there was near desperation on the Israeli Arab uh, parties, um, pleading, pleading, pleading with the voters to come out. Um, again, this may be uh, a reflection of legislation passed in Israel, the, nat the uh, nation state law. Uh, this may be just a sense of disillusionment with actually the leadership of the Israeli Arab parties in the Knesset who seem to be more interested in supporting the Palestinian Authority and Hamas and bashing Israel and being parts of boats in, uh, coming to land in Gaza than representing the real interests of the uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, in the end, they did get in. Um, that would have been very worrying, by the way, that there would be no representation of the Israeli Arab 20% uh, minority. Luckily, that didn't happen, and uh, we don't have to face that dilemma. So, perhaps to summarise, Netanyahu wins another election. These are uh, elections which were seen as a test on Netanyahu. It was about Netanyahu. It wasn't about a two-state solution, yes or no. It wasn't about the economy. It was about Netanyahu. And the people of Israel said that they would prefer Netanyahu than three uh, former chiefs of staff um, to deal with the security situation, to deal with Trump's plan uh, and to represent them. We saw the collapse of the Labour Party. Merits just got in. That is um, an indication of the Blue and White Party consuming smaller parties on the left. The failure of the Blue and White Party was to run a campaign as sleek as the Likuds the um and to win right wing votes we see 16 seats going to the Haredi parties today Israel has a right wing Haredi government um and more right wing than we've seen before the surprise is as we speak it's not clear whether Naftali Bennett will get in um, at the moment, he's not. At the most, if he could only get four seats, he's on that borderline of needing to get uh, the minimum number of uh, votes to get its first seat in the Knesset. Um, and also, um, Moshe Feiglin, who was, going to, was seen as getting seven to eight seats, not uh, getting into the Knesset either. 
I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, again, it was a long night, so I hope I was coherent. Um, summer season's about to start. I'm off to England tomorrow. Um, summer season starting in Israel very soon. If you haven't yet booked a seminar with me, let me know. Um, we are also already opening bookings for October, November. I'm going to be on the road. Uh, so let me know if I can come and speak there as well. If you're interested in having a podcast um, or a web webinar um, meeting with your community or just get me to come and speak, let me know as well. You can contact me uh, on my Twitter account, which is at Awesome Seminars or via my website, awesomeseminars.com. Um, so, yeah, check those out. And if you haven't yet checked out, we also have courses online, which you can do via awesomeseminars.com. Until next time, never a dull moment, that's for sure. My name's Neil Lazarus, and thank you for listening. Thank you.